Hello and welcome to week six of our School District 46 Parenting Through Difficult Times uh, for secondary students or parents of secondary students. Uh, this is our last week together and I just want to say thank you in advance for showing up and watching the videos, uh, whether they, that was in live or on replay. Um, I appreciate your your views and your participation. Again, I'm Sarah Joseph and I help people by empowering them with tools that help strengthen relationships. Tonight we're talking about parenting from fear or love and trust. Um, and I thought this was a good topic to close out our sessions with because I thought it would help us just have a, a bigger picture of where we're going <laughs> and where we're parenting from. Um, and help us kind of wrap up our, our time together. Um, so I wanted to start with this little poem. Um, and it goes like this. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor cherries in yesterday. Just take a minute to let that sit and land. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. As we come out of this and have time for discussion, or if you have some thoughts, you can throw them into the chat box. Um, Jane Nelson and Cheryl Irwin wrote this book, Parents Who Love Too Much. Um, and they got a lot of questions. How is it possible to love your children too much? Well, one of the things that we might do when we're parenting from fear is do things that are unloving um, in the name of love. So for instance, pampering or um, doing other things that don't help our children really feel loved or develop responsibility, that sense of connection and, and belonging, um, that sense of significance or capability that we've talked about in previous weeks. Um, we, we, do, we do have a lot of fears as parents, and I think that's normal, right? We, we we want so much for our children. When we have children, we have all these dreams and hopes um, and aspirations, and we just see them, we see so much goodness in them and so much um, potential in them that, you know, it's only natural to fear that that goodness will be, will be changed or their potential will not be realized or they'll be sidetracked, or some, some harm will come to them. Um, it is, you know, they are an, ex an extension of us somewhat. Our heart is like out there in the world, right? And so the fear of, of something negative happening, something bad happening, of them being hurt in some way, um, or not living up to the potential is, is painful. Um, and I came up with this list um, with another group of some of the fears that, that us parents have. Um, and yeah, it's fears that they won't, they won't get good grades or be successful. They won't be able to earn a good living. They'll never leave the house. <laughs> um, they might do something dangerous and get hurt um, or follow the wrong crowd right? They might not do well in school or get in trouble in school, uh, or they won't have any friends. They might get rejected. Um, 
that that they'll feel entitled that they'll act entitled right or they won't be respectful or have good manners um, we might wonder like what other people think of our kids um, or that they'll experiment or get addicted to drugs alcohol sex um, screens or or attempt suicide right so many fears and i'm sure that we could go on and on and make another page worth of of fears that we have um, once you get that ball rolling it seems to be easier to add more things in <laughs> um i just i i want you to you know recognize that the fear is there and i want to validate your fears because they are real fears we see we see this happen to kids all the time and you know, um, we just, it's hard to imagine that happening to your own child and that's where the fear comes from, right? How would we handle this? What would we do? Um, it would, yeah, it would break our hearts to see our kids physically hurt or following the wrong crowd or, you know, getting addicted to drugs. Um, and so often what happens when we have these fears is that we start reacting based on our fears. So we might try, we might try to control them or shame them, yell at them, interrogate, invade their privacy, revoke privileges or ground them, lecture them, manipulate negotiations with them, not involve them in problem solving, just rescue and fix. Um, and when, we, when we're reacting based on our fears, um, often we're, we're also enabling our kids, right? That's one of the things that we do is we enable because we do too much for them. Or the, the hovering, right? We hover, we overprotect, we might make up excuses for them because we're, we're afraid that they're gonna get in trouble or they're going to fail. So we might lie for them, right? Um, we do we do the the <laughs> the lectures of um, telling them what happened and what caused it to happen and how they should feel um, and what they should do about it, right? Well, we might say something like, well, no wonder I saw you wasting time on YouTube and spending too much time texting your friends and sleeping in. You should feel ashamed of yourself. You'd better shape up or you'll be shipping out to live on the streets like a bum. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, we also sometimes when we're living in fear when we're we're reacting from fear we might live in denial we might think our child could never do such a thing um be oblivious to the 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 <laughs> the possibility of them doing drugs or having sex believing things um just not not educating yourself Right, I can tell you that um, my my mother lived in that for a long time, and so did my husband's mother. Lived in in this denial that their children could be doing drugs or partying or drinking, right? Um, and the other thing that we we do a lot is rescue or fix them. So um, we might we might try to we might think that we're <laughs> We have this fear that they're going to get into trouble and we think that we're helping but we overstep the helping line and we fix things right so when we're doing when we're doing these things i know that it's coming from a place of love it's coming from a place of wanting the best for our children um, and i think it's a really good a good uh practice for us to sit back and check in with ourselves is this really coming from a place of love or is it too much love? Is it fear that's driving it, right? Can we empower instead of enable? 
right? And when we empower, we share control with our kids so that they can develop skills to have power over their own lives. We, we teach them life skills and we focus on solutions together. We have faith. We say things like, I have faith in you. I trust you to figure out what you need. I know that when it's important to you, you'll know what to do, right? We ex respect their privacy. We tell them that we respect their privacy and we want them to know that we're available if they want to discuss something with us, right? We can express our limits. Um, you know, we can still, it's, this isn't about giving them free reign. This is still about setting respectful limits um, on what's okay, right? Or having a respectful attitude and tone of voice is essential. Then that's what you tell them, right? If we can't talk, um, then that's, it's not okay to yell at me, right? Um, one of the things that we do for empowering our kids is, is we let go um, in small steps, right? We let go of their issues. We let go of being in control, <laughs> right? Of not knowing, <laughs> let go of those things. Um, we love and we encourage them, right? Um, and, and we make agreements, not rules. So we ask, can we sit down and see if we can work on a plan regarding your homework that we can both live with instead of, instead of just making the rule and not them not having, being part of that conversation or having a voice in that conversation, right? Uh, we use the joint problem solving to come up with solutions that work for everybody. And we engage in respectful communication. Um, we, we use information versus orders, right? So something like, I notice you spend a lot of time watching television and talking on the phone during the time you have set aside for homework. Or I notice you often leave your homework until the last minute and then feel discouraged about getting it done on time. So using those I notice statements is a nice way to provide information um, without lecturing or shaming, right? Without ordering them to get off the phone and get your homework done. <laughs> um, and the other thing is we encourage them to learn from their mistakes. So we can say things like, I can see that you feel bad about getting that poor grade. I have faith in you to learn from this and figure out what you need to do to get the grade you would like, right? We help them increase, increase their self-awareness by asking them curiosity questions, by asking them questions that help them reflect on, them, on what they want. Like, how do you feel? Or what do you think? Or how does this affect what you want in your life? When we're using empowering actions and statements, um, what we're really doing is we're not thinking of short range solutions or stopping a certain behavior or rescuing. Um, we're looking past that. We're, um, we're hoping that we're including them in the control and we're, um, maybe even turning control over to them so they have power over their own lives. And this power that we're giving them often leads, leads to mistakes and failures that they can learn from, right? And when we understand and trust that learning from mistakes and failures is a, an important part of a successful life process, we, we, we are able to help them through that where they're able to be there to support them through that and to show up as that that guide that mentor that in encourager the safe haven to for them to fall back on right we're able to be being part of their team that that lifts them up and inspires them and encourages them to get back on the horse and try again right um 
Yeah. So when we're responding with love and trust instead of fear, we, we, we do these things. We show faith in them to solve, solve problems. We listen and validate their feelings and we make a connection before trying to correct their behavior or offer suggestions or advice. We listen for understanding before we jump to offering suggestions and advice, <laughs> right? Um, we ask a lot of curiosity questions because we wanna know what they know and we wanna know what they want. We want to get a better perspective um, on, on their world. We're able to set loving limits, right? Allow, we're able to say no and allow them to have a reaction and have feelings to that no. It's okay to be disappointed when you don't get what you want, right? We're able to have those conversations in family meetings and joint problem solving, or we're able to work together towards a common goal. Um, or find solutions to things that aren't working for us in our family home. And we also are able to stand back and allow natural consequences to happen um, with loving support and not, I told you so, attitude, right? Now, I think <laughs> this is the goal <laughs> of parenting. Um, with positive discipline. This is the goal of, of positive discipline. It's not about um, helping parents to manage their children, but really positive discipline is a program to help parents empower their children to manage themselves. And before we got on to this recording, I was mentioning that um, we were talking about screen time a bit, and I was I was saying that I really take the, the stance that as a parent, it's my job to teach my kids how to manage their screen time themselves. So I don't believe as a parent that I should be policing my children's um, screen use. Now, with that said, my children are a bit younger than, than, than teens. They're not quite teens yet. And at this point, I am policing and regulating their screen time. And I do that because they're not old enough to do it for themselves. And they haven't learned the, the stages, the life lessons um, to keep themselves safe, to moderate, um, or to understand how to act appropriately online. And so it takes time for training just like it takes time for training in cooking and in cleaning and in having respectful conversations and learning how to problem solve. All of that takes time for, for training. It takes time to learn those, those lessons and those skills. And so I think it's important that we recognize that this, this training or teaching of our children um, to manage themselves it does take time and we are it is our responsibility to to train and inspire and encourage and protect right we need to set boundaries we need to set limits um, and i think what's important is how we do that when we do it with our children um, when we do it in a loving way and allow for feelings to be felt that's very different than being a dictator right? Um, and if we just, you know, think about the different types of parenting styles that there are, we have, um, we have a few different ones that, you know, the dictatorship, <laughs> right? Um, or, and then we have um, more permissiveness, right? And then the positive discipline would, would be more democratic parenting. So, you know, we're, we're looking for input and feedback from our kids. We're looking to, to share the control and the power um, and, and to help nurture them into a place where they feel empowered to take control. Now, I thought that it, might, it was a good time to talk about letting go. Um, 
I feel like parenting is just one big old lesson in letting go, right? From the time our kids start walking um, or riding a bike, right? Or crossing the street, going for a sleepover at a friend's house, <laughs> you know, like it's just all these steps that help us as parents <laughs> learn how to let go. And um, as our children become um, adolescents, uh, it gets it gets a little more challenging, I think, because because again we have to we have all these fears built in. Um, we know we know what we did when we were teens, <laughs> and that's scary. <laughs> um, and so the fears make it more difficult to let go. But we really must have confidence in what we've taught our children. Right? We have to have confidence that they'll know that they, they are safe to go out and explore the world, to take risks and try and fail, and to, that, that we're going to be here for them to come back to, to be held when they need it, to be lifted up and encouraged all over again, right? that we will be there to catch them when they fall. Um, and you know, letting go doesn't mean that we're abandoning them. It means that we're empowering them to learn responsibility and feel capable, right? To, to step into their own. Um, when, when we take on other people's stuff, whether that be responsibility or emotions, what we're doing really is robbing them from the opportunity to feel empowered, to feel capable, to learn that lesson, to stand in their own power, we're, we're taking that away from them. It also feels like a burden to us, right? <laughs> like we try to do it, we do it sometimes because we feel like we need to take control or we have these fears, right, that are happening and so um, or we feel like they're not capable or they're going to get hurt or something. So we swoop in and we take responsibility for whatever it is. It might be something like homework or finding a job or writing a resume, or it could be, um, you know, holding their emotions for them so that they don't have to deal with it. All of that is us robbing them from the op that, that life lesson, right? From that opportunity to stand in their own power, to see how capable they are. Mm -hmm. So, we gotta have faith. Ooh, we gotta have faith. <laughs> <laughs> Rudolf Drecker said, children never learn to think for themselves if we do it all for them and hand it down ready-made. I couldn't agree more. We need to allow our children to think for themselves. We need to ask them curiosity questions and find out what they think and what they know, what they think their, the solution could be. We can do this through um, expressing faith, right? I have faith that you can figure out a solution. I have faith that you will do what is right for you. I got to say, when, when, when I was, when I hear these comments, it makes me feel more capable. I don't know about you, but when I hear somebody saying, I have faith in you to figure it out, I go, oh, yeah. I can figure it out, right? There's all of a sudden, I, I feel more empowered. I feel, I feel more capable. I hope, I hope that our children feel the same way. And I think that they do. I think that you can actually see the bolstering of, of pride <laughs> and empowerment when you use these statements. Um, when we avoid rescuing, um, we, we help them see how capable they are. So one of the tricks for this is try not to do things for kids that you know they can do for themselves. Um, really encourage them to, to do the best they can and then, and then offer help after that. 
right? And then use encouragement to show faith in, in their ability as well. So, you know, like I noticed you're sticking with that problem even though it's hard for you, even though it's tough, right? I can see that you're, you know, you're really determined to get this done. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's so important that we, we show faith in our kids and we allow them to step into that power. Um, because so often our kids don't have faith in their own abilities, right? A lot of the kids that I see in counseling, um, and I, I think that I get, I get the worst. So I think I feel that there's probably a lot of other kids out there who have a lack of self-confidence and a lack of self-esteem, really don't see their, their worth or their potential, um, and are really struggling with um, that confidence to see the confidence or the, the to feel their own capability. Um, and... I think this comes from a lot of um, a lot of the parenting that we have have experienced and that that we offer um, with rescuing and fixing um, the hovering the helicopter parenting that's so common nowadays, um, but also just like praising instead of encouraging. So when we when we're praising, we're offering some superficial comment. <laughs> that's often about us, right? I'm so proud of you, or um, I like what you did, or, um, you know, you got all A's, you get a big reward. Those types of things are very um, superficial, and they don't ask the child to contemplate what they think or to self-reflect, and they don't reflect the child's effort. So an encouragement statement would be more like, you should be proud of yourself. You worked so hard to get those A's. Um, something like, what do you like about it? Right? Or, uh, yeah, the I notice statements of, I notice you're sticking with that problem. Or I saw how, um, how determined you were. Right. So th think about the language that you're using with your kids um, that will help bolster their confidence and help them see how capable they are. Um, again, I think it's a good check in to see to see are we making this about us <laughs> or is this about our kids? Right. A lot. A lot of a lot of when we're parenting from fear, a lot of our comments get and end up being about us, right? About how we feel, about how, what we're afraid of, um, about what they've done right to appease our fears. So when we're able to just check in with ourselves more regularly about where, where is this comment coming from or what am I really feeling in this moment, um, it's helpful to make sure that we're on the right track. It's helpful to make sure that we are, are turning to these um, statements of empowering versus those statements or actions of enabling. Okay, so I think that's the end for tonight of that slideshow. And I just want to say thank you again um, for joining me over the last six weeks. And all of the recorded videos are on my YouTube channel, which is Connect with Sarah Joseph. Um, and yes, thank you. I hope you found value in these videos in this series. Um, and we'll, we'll search out more information about parenting teens. Um, some of my favorite resources are the Brainstorm book that I mentioned before by Daniel Siegel. Um, and there's a lovely podcast by my friend, um, Casey Rorty. She has a podcast and, um, called, and she wrote a great book too called Joyful Courage. Um, those are really wonderful, um, resources for parents who 
are par um, who are parenting teens and um, yeah, just just keep on <laughs> having faith in yourself and your capability to parent <laughs> adolescents and in your children. All right, thank you very much.